If you have your Bibles, if you'll take those, we're continuing this series on Jesus and Moses. There are some in the series that will be um, pretty dramatic and obvious, I, I think, uh, the, where we deal with the parting of the Red Sea and some things like that. T- tonight's message is more about some of the, the character of the two men, some of the things that they experienced in terms of their own internal selves. So this may not be the most exciting one in this series, but it is important and it may give you a look at both Jesus and Moses that you've not really uh, considered all that much. So if you have your Bibles, turn to, uh, first of all, to Luke chapter 2, 41 through 52, Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 41. Now his parents, that is Jesus, of course, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child, Jesus, tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey And then they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple. Let me not go past that too fast. After three days. So imagine you're in the largest city in the country and you have come from a village, out of the way village, and you spend three days searching for your 12-year-old. The next verse is... An understatement. It says, and they were wroth with him. (laughs) I'd have been jerking my belt off. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, the the doctors of the of theology, if you will, of scripture. This is this the 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 rabbis who spend do nothing but study the, the Bible asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Knew ye not, I must be about my father's business. And they understood not the saying which he spoke unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now turn to the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. And I'll begin reading at verse 24. 11 and 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. He had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, Not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, as saying to do, were drowned. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in the next few moments, I pray that your spirit will so brush aside every barrier to divine communication, everything you want to say to us, that we may hear it, God, somehow, that despite the weakness of the speaker or distractions of listeners, that we would hear what you have to say. And we believe you for it. In the wonderful name, Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen. In these two passages which we read tonight, Jesus first in Jerusalem and Moses in Egypt make an identification that transcends 
their locale and their culture. You must remember, Moses is 40 years old. Not, of course, not in the book of Hebrews, but in the passage that Hebrews references. When it says he made the decision to identify with, with the people of God and not with the Egyptians. He's 40 years old. He has been raised his whole life as an Egyptian. He has an Egyptian name. His, his grandfather, or maybe I should say step-grandfather, is the most powerful man in the world. He is the Pharaoh of Egypt. I, th I think it's easy to underestimate this. He is phenomenally wealthy, hugely powerful. For all we know, he may be in line for the throne of Egypt. We, we don't know for sure, but there's the possibility that he's in line. He is the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So his grandfather, at least by this method of being found and adopted, he is Pharaoh's grandson. He is an Egyptian. All he's heard is Egyptian, who he is a prince, someone in the, in the line of the throne perhaps. And yet he makes the decision to identify with a totally different culture, a totally different race, something that the Egyptians do not understand, do not comprehend. Why, why would he do that? Why would he say, I'm not an Egyptian, the most powerful race and nation in the world. I am a Hebrew, a nation of slaves in a foreign country. Because his identification, his personal identification, transcends Egypt and has to do with something else. Listen then to what the, the book of Hebrews says. Adds a new wrinkle to it. Choosing to identify with Jesus. So <laughs> Hebrews says that by faith, not knowing, thousands of years before Jesus is born, Moses says... I identify with that yet to come, that Savior, that Messiah, that hope of Israel, that Redeemer of the world. I'm not an Egyptian. I'm not a prince. I'm not the grandson of Pharaoh. I identify with a transcendent reality that none of you can even see or comprehend. Now hold that in mind. Jesus has been raised 12 years in Nazareth. He is a child. I'm saying 12. But he is a child. But old enough to make the trip for Passover for Pesach with his parents to Jerusalem. Perhaps even there, in a sense, to be bar mitzvah. And all he has known, as far as anybody knows, is Nazareth. All he has known is his father's shop. All he has known is his mother's teaching. He's learned everything he knows at his mother's knee. And when his parents return to Nazareth, he stays behind for three days. Isn't that interesting? He stays behind for three days in the, in the temple with the top biblical scholars of the nation. And it says, asking them questions which, by the way, is the predominant method of rabbinical Bible study, is questions, questions. So this little boy is asking them these questions. It says they, the wisdom of the questions, the depth of the questions, is so astonishing that people say, who is this child? Who is he? Three days this has been going on, and these adults walk in and say, what are you doing? You, you frightened us. Why did you treat us like this? Why did you do this? We were weeping and crying and wandering the streets of Jerusalem. Why did you do this? And Jesus says, I do not identify with you any longer. I identify, knew ye not, I must be about my father's business. I'm no longer about Joseph and Joseph's business. I'm no longer about Nazareth. I identify with a culture and a rea transcendent reality that you know nothing about. So Moses transcends Egypt, 
Jesus of Nazareth transcends Nazareth and Israel, and he says, I must be about my father's business. He chooses to identify with heaven as Moses identifies with the Hebrew people and by faith with Jesus. Now, what does it mean? It means that they are now on a journey, a trajectory, both of them, are on a trajectory that sets them apart from everybody. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but let's dwell for just a moment that both of them have an odd and kind of false start to their ministry. I, I know that sounds strange to say it about Jesus, but hold that in a moment. So Moses, having made the identification with the Hebrew people, he chooses to be a Hebrew. Now he sees one of the slave masters beating a Hebrew and he kills him. It's manslaughter at the least and perhaps even murder too. And they get in a fight and he kills him. And then has to flee Egypt and goes to Midian. And so he makes a false start. It doesn't work. He tries and it doesn't work. Now, I'm not going to say Jesus made a false start and that he tried and it didn't work. I'm going to say that there is an odd moment that is too early and doesn't work. And it's his mother's fault. <laughs> They're at the wedding at Cana of Galilee. And she comes to him and says, look, son, the wedding has run out of wine. Listen to what Jesus says. Think about it. He says, woman... First of all, woman, what have I to do with this? My time has not yet come. It's not right. This is, this is the wrong moment. You're in too early. D don't do this. And my friend, Doran Heiliger, who is a, a Jew in Jerusalem, he told me it's the most Jewish story in the New Testament. He said it's a perfect look at a Jewish mother. She doesn't argue with him. She doesn't berate him. Nothing. She ignores him. She turns to the others and says whatever he says to do, do it, and she leaves the room. <laughs> Doran says, that's Jewish. <laughs> so he does it. He turns the water into wine. One of this great, this great story. But listen to, to me. It has nothing to do with the rest of his ministry. It's an, an isolated event, a unique moment that's out of time. He even says, I'm not to start yet. God, God doesn't want me. It's not the right timing. She says, I don't know anything about God or timing. Change the water to wine. <laughs> so both of them, in a sense, are operating in a moment in time which, is, which has an awkwardness separated from the rest of their lives and the rest of their leadership. Moses' life can be divided up into three 40-year segments, 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in Midian, 40 years in the desert. Jesus' life is separated up into two segments, 30 years in the carpenter shop, three years in, in ministry, 40, 40, 40, 30, and three. The, the leadership of both men causes them to have a separation from the people that are around them. They both condemn the culture in which they live. Moses, remember, doesn't just judge and condemn the culture of Egypt. He condemns and judges the culture of the Hebrew people in the desert. He denounces them. He's angry with them. He, at times he wants, even to, he wants to kill them all. And at times, he hurls himself on the Hebrew people and pleads with God not to kill them all. But there is a separation. Moses never quite fits in. He doesn't fit in in Egypt. He doesn't quite fit in in Midian. He's married there. He spends 40 years there. But he doesn't quite fit in. God constantly, he leaves Egypt, goes to Midian. God calls him out of Midian, calls him to the Hebrew people. But he never, he never quite fits in. There's this separation, this oddness. The same is true with Jesus. Jesus, we, we don't know very much about the 30 years, but imagine 
can we dilate our creative minds enough to realize there must have been extremely odd conversations? We see it in the story at the temple. Knew ye not, I must be about my father's business. And it says they didn't know what he said. His parents couldn't understand him. He's a 12-year-old. He says, knew ye not, I must be about my father's business. They didn't understand him for the next 18 years. He submits himself to the culture that he's in, but he stands over against it. His life is judgment on the culture in which he stands, which makes him, like Moses, different. They judged that the accepted reality in which they live, the cultural, philosophical reality, the mores, which were accepted in the world in which they lived, were wrong. Slaves, Moses says to Egypt, you don't own these people. Egypt says, yes, I do. They're not to be slaves. Slaves. Egypt says, yes, they are. He challenges the fundamental power system of Egypt. He says to Pharaoh, you have no power over me, over the slaves. God is the ultimate power. Jesus says to the two principal power systems in which he lives, Rome and the religious leadership of Israel under Roman occupation, he says to both of them, you have no power. He says, if you remember the night that he was arrested, Pontius Pilate said, don't you understand? I, he says, speak to me, help me. I don't want to kill you. I have the power to have you crucified. And Jesus says, no, you don't. He said, you have no power over me. You only have whatever power God allows you to have. I could snap my fingers and legions and legions of angels would come and rescue me. You have no power. You're nothing. Moses says to Pharaoh, you send an, hour, an army after me, I'll drown them. God says to, to Rome, you have no authority over me. Not only that, he challenges the religious leadership of his own culture. He says to the, to the scribes and the Pharisees, he calls them the hypocrites that they are. So if, you challenge, if one challenges the leadership, the administration, the management, the power systems, and the mores of the world in which you live, you are viewed as odd. You don't fit in. You don't fit in in Egypt. You don't fit in in Midian. You don't even fit in. Moses doesn't even fit in with his own people for 40 years in the desert. There are times when they don't even want to be around him. Jesus doesn't fit in with his own family. He doesn't fit in with his own culture. He doesn't fit in with the Romans. They, they are separated. Not just, by, not just by judgment as in sin. But they condemned the religious, political power systems of the age in which they live, and the social structures, the, the, the very structures of the way that they think. Moses challenges the fundamental essence of community. He says, we are bound together not by our slavery, but by our God. The, ident the central identifying reality of the Hebrews in the land of Goshen was slavery, their race being enslaved. Moses says, we are beyond that. We transcend that. We identify with the blood on the, by faith, we just read it, by faith he practiced the first Passover. By faith he applied the blood. By faith he identified with Jesus. He says our fundamental identification can never be our race and it can never be our location and it can never be our condition. It's not that we're Jews and it's not that we're slaves and it's not where they're in the land of Goshen. Our identification is through the blood by the God that saves us. Jesus says to the Pharisees and to the scribes and to the hypocrites, you think the most important thing in the world is the way that you understand the Bible, but the Bible teaches about me. 
He says, you missed the whole point. You pour over the scripture and you've missed the point of everything that you study. You've missed the central point. I am the central point. You, you see that these two men stand apart in the generation in which they live. Third, they stand apart in the one thing that the power systems of this world hate. And that is fearlessness. Power hates fearlessness because it deprives power of the control mechanism. Once you can, once anybody says to the prevailing power systems, whether it's religious or denominational or national or legal, when you say, I don't want anything that you've got and you can't take away anything that I've got. You have no control over me and I have no fear of you. Nothing you do to me. The power systems hate that because it is the frank admission of their powerlessness to control you. The most dangerous person in any society is the one who's the most fearless. Jesus and Moses stood in fearlessness. Moses standing before the Pharaoh, the king, the most powerful king in the world, and the most, with the most powerful army in the world, totally fearless. Jesus standing before both Rome, the idolatrous, wicked, pagan, Gentile power, and the prevailing liturgical religious power of his day. And he said, I fear nothing you can do to me. That makes you, that makes you, un everybody around you, uncomfortable. People live in such fear all the time that when somebody is fearless, they, the rest of the world feels squeamish around them. Next, the truth not only is fearlessness hated by power, the truth is hated by phoniness. There is nothing in the world that fakes hate worse than the true reality. Moses showed not only true fearlessness, he showed the true power and presence of God Almighty. Do you remember this story about the snakes? You remember that? Moses throws, his, Moses throws his staff down and it becomes a snake. And Pharaoh is totally unimpressed. Oh, he says, well, I, my, my magicians can do the same thing. And so he calls his magicians in. They throw their staffs down and they do become snakes. So at some level, they can duplicate that. Until Moses' serpent eats theirs. And then Moses says, you like that? Try this one. And he takes the snake up by the tail and it turns back into his staff. And he touches the, the dust and it becomes lice or fleas. It's not clear in scripture. What Insects. And Moses says, do that. A Pharaoh says, do that to his magicians. And they say, we cannot duplicate this because this is, and they use a Hebrew expression, this is the finger of God, which is a Hebrew idiomatic expression for the Holy Spirit. They said, this is, this is not the fake spirit of witchcraft and ledger domain. This is the true spirit, and we cannot duplicate it. Now, what did the people say when Jesus preached? They said, he speaks with truth and power and authority, not like the scribes and the Pharisees. This is not going to make him beloved of the Pharisees. The truth that he spoke indicted the phoniness of what they said. So not only did they stand apart from power in fearlessness, they stood apart from phoniness in truth. Then there is the reality of the transcendence. Jesus has experienced pre-existence. I, I don't know if we can even, I know I can't, 
Can you even begin to dilate your creative imagination to imagine what it's like to walk among people as a physical human being, the same systems work in your body that work in theirs, the whole time you are remembering what it was like to be with God, the Word, to be God, before light was spoken into existence. That that all exists in your conscious memory while you are living in the realm of people and the natural things. So you're remembering pre-existence when they're asking you if you want some more pita bread. That, that, that just makes a person different, unique. How can I say it better? Odd. That puts an oddness around them, around him. Moses walks up on the mountain and he is confronted with the burning bush and he hears the voice of God and he is summoned and, and God gives him this anointing and this blaze of truth and he walks in and, and speaks to Pharaoh and frees two and a half million slaves. Yes, they love him. Yes, they follow him. Yes, they believe in him. But they're, they're also slightly terrified of him and they know that he has seen something and experienced something that they never have and never will. That makes you odd. Beyond that, there is how that gets manifested in the relationships in which they have to deal. So, in Mark chapter 3, they come to Jesus and they say, your mother and your brothers are outside and want to see you. And Jesus says, who is my brother? Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? All these people. These people that need God and love God and want to serve God. This, this is my family. This is my family. It says that when he begins to appoint, do you remember this passage? When he begins to appoint the 12 apostles, that his friends come and try to restrain him because they think he's lost his mind. They, th they think he's, they said he's beside himself, it says in the King James Version. They think he's crazy. He's separated from his family. He, he, he's, he's, his own brothers don't believe in him. I have an older brother. <laughs> if he told me he was the Messiah, he'd have to raise from the dead before I believed it. So they, they grow up with him. They see him. They, they work in the shop with him. He's 30 years of age. Now he's appointing apostles and sending them out two by two to raise, to raise the dead and cast out demons and heal the sick. And they said, well, we need to talk to you. And he says, everybody's my family. I'm no closer to you with whom I spent 30 years than I am with, the first, with the, any stranger that loves Jehovah God and wants to serve him. So he's separated from his family. Moses, in leadership, his brother Aaron and his sister Miriam turn against him, foment a, a rebellion, try to drag him down, and on the basis of his interracial marriage, they claim his marriage is wrong, and they try to drag him down and defeat him based on his marriage. So even among the people of the Hebrews, he is unique and stands out, and his, his whole family structure begins to separate. Stay with me. I, I, I'm leading you to something. I know this sounds strange, but stay with me. Until God says to them, he strikes them with leprosy, Aaron and Miriam, and he says, the only way I'll heal you is if you humble yourself and come to your brother and let him pray for you, ask him to forgive you and let him pray for you. So are they his brother and sister? Are Miriam and Aaron the brother and sister of Moses? Or are they leprous, diseased people who need his touch and his redemptive healing power? Yes, what about the brother? What about James, the brother of Jesus? 
Is he James, the brother of Jesus, or is he a sinner who needs to be saved like everybody else? <laughs> yes. So they are of the Hebrews, of Egypt, not in Egypt. They're different. They're fearless. They're powerful. They're powerless. They are the same as everybody else. They're completely different from everybody else. And, and that uniqueness sets them apart into something that I, I just want to bring this. And that is the inherent loneliness of the differentness of walking with God. I've said all of this to tell you the closer anyone walks with God in a world that is not walking with God, the odder you look, the stranger you look. You can have a redemptive effect. You can have a redemptive influence, but you're going to look strange. I find that the contemporary American church spends so much time trying to not look different that we may actually lose part of the power of differentness. And I'm not talking about becoming a bunch of neo-Amish Pentecostals that all have to wear long sleeve dresses and nobody wears makeup. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about values, things that... Things that are wrong, and we know they're wrong, and we won't say they're wrong. Things that the contemporary generation sees humor as justifying anything. I know it's wrong. I know it's blasphemous. I know it's wicked. I know all the, but boy, it was so funny. There ought to be some moment where the people of God say, A, it's not funny. B, it's wrong, and C, I'm not laughing at it, and you're making a mistake to laugh at it. But if you do that, if you do that, like Moses' family said of him, who do you think you are? Like Jesus' friends and family said of him, he's, he's lost his mind. He's beside himself. There is in this Christian walk an inherent Loneliness. We assuage it to a certain extent by being with other people who share our loneliness. That's why the Bible says, do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves. You need to be with other people who are living in the same odd, lonely experience you are. We are a peculiar people, peculiarly precious to God, exceptionally wonderful and blessed of God, but I got, I got to tell you, slightly odd in a world where the uniformity is sin. Where the uniform is sin, somebody who won't wear the uniform looks odd or even rebellious or smug, or self-righteous, or sanctimonious, all the things you get accused of. That's what Moses' brother and his sister said. Who do you think you are? Are you the only one that can hear from God? And God said he's not the only one. He's just better than anybody else. <laughs> it can make you seem odd. So Jesus, even to the end of his life, now, Jesus in the garden at Gethsemane, he has been this odd, alone figure. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3 says, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. In one verse, Isaiah 53, verse 3, in one verse, Jesus is called despised twice in one verse. Despised doesn't just mean hated, it means unvalued. Even to the end of his life, 
alone in the garden at Gethsemane and praying, oh God, do I have to do this? I, you, his humanity surfaces. His humanity surfaces. He says, take this cup from my lips. But then his divine love takes control. Nevertheless, thy, let thy will be done. So he is alone. Even his best friends won't stay awake with him and pray. Now listen to this. This is a great truth if you can hear this. Jesus understands everything you could ever go through. But we will never understand what he goes through. That's the wonder of his sympathetic grace. There's nothing you can ever go through. No rejection, no betrayal, no pain, no loneliness. The loneliness and the uniqueness of feeling odd in a world where oddness is not valued. And Jesus says, I understand, I understand. But we will never understand what he experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane. We may try to sympathize, we may try to empathize, but we, we do not understand what Jesus goes through, but he understands what we go through. I want to close with this. You've been very patient. I, uh, I chose to close with this story, and then when Allison told me she was going to come tonight, I nearly canceled. I thought, I'm not going to tell this because I didn't want to embarrass her, but I'd already made my mind up to close with this. So when Allison was 15, in a family in Maryland, functional atheists, if not atheists, uh, a mother who went occasionally to the Methodist church, father who went way less occasionally, who told me he didn't believe in heaven or hell, a functional atheist family, two brothers who were very bad boys and alcohol and gambling. Fifteen, she went off to a Youth for Christ convention in Atlantic City and she got saved. Do you understand there's saved, saved, and then there's saved. Anybody understand the difference? There's church camp saved, you know. That lasts till football season starts. And then there's 100% saved, born again, saved, washed in the blood, saved. And she came home from that youth convention. She had the whole nine yards. And it, it made her odd in the school. I saw the oddness immediately. First thing she did, she came home, was break up with me. I felt that was very odd. I did. Who, after all, in their right, what girl in her right mind? <laughs> she said, I found the Lord. And she said, I, I'm, I'm bound for heaven and you're not taking me where I'm bound and you're out. She broke up with me. She was the homecoming queen, the most popular girl in the school. Beautiful. Homecoming queen, captain of the cheerleaders. She took her cheerleading uniform and went to the principal's office and turned her cheerleading uniform in and she said, I'm resigning from the cheerleaders. Girls in high school in those days, I don't know if it still is, but in those days, girls would lop off their right arms to make the cheerleaders. Nobody quit the cheerleaders. He said, what are you talking about? She said, I quit. She was the captain of the cheerleaders. I quit. Here's my uniform. Let some other girl have it. Why? She said, we'll go in the car to go to the games. All they do is drink and smoke and talk about things I don't want to hear about. Boys I don't want to hear about. I'm not involved in that. I don't want to do that anymore. He's, he said, I'm calling the county school psychiatrist. They brought the school, the Montgomery County school psychiatrist came to minister healing to her. She was crazy. Obviously, it had to be crazy to resign from the cheerleaders. <laughs> he opened his briefcase to talk to her about it. 
was going to light up a cigarette. She said, he said, will you talk to me about this? She said, of course. First, let me pray with you about breaking this nicotine habit. <laughs> he, closed his, he closed his briefcase and left. Fearless. He's, he must have gone to the principal's office. He never came back. Finally, she just realized he wasn't coming back. She went to class. <laughs> I know what happened. He went to the office and said, I don't know. She's just odd. That's an odd little girl. She's odd. Then she found that there was an office in the Student Government Association. They hadn't had one in years, but they had it in print called the chaplain of the school. She said, I'm going to run for chaplain. <laughs> Unopposed. <laughs> it's a landslide election. <laughs> Beautiful. Captain of their cheerleaders, resigns the cheerleader squad. Homecoming queen. She went around all the school all the time with a jar on slot in the top saying, will you help me with the... And she rented a school bus every Saturday night and took everybody from the high school all the way down to Washington, D.C., to go to the Youth for Christ rallies. She called me back. She said, you, you want to start dating me? I said, yes. I, I want to start dating you. She said, all right, there's two rules. She said, I'll start dating again, but she said, it's going to be clean. She said, the second thing is, you have, well, three things. She said, you have to go to church with me. I said, at the Methodist church? She said, oh, no, I've left the Methodist church. She said, I've joined the Congregational Holiness. I said, oh, my God. <laughs> I said, I have to go with you to the Holiness church? She said, yeah, if you want to be with me, you have to go with me. Okay. What's the third thing? She said, you have to ride the school bus down to the Youth for Christ rallies in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I said, oh, God, baby, please. Every Saturday night, we get on that drafty, cold school bus to drive down to downtown Washington, D.C. Watch, I've seen every corny Billy Graham movie ever made. Oh, God, what got into his head to think he could make movies? And I'd be on that school bus. I had my letter sweater on. I was the point guard on the basketball team, the quarterback on the football team. <laughs> and I'm on the school bus with every geek in the high school. And they're all saying, if you're happy and you know, I'm there, oh my God. I thought I could be anywhere. And I'd look over at this sweet little dumpling beside me and she'd pat my hand. She said, it's so much more fun when you're here. I said, <laughs> odd. Odd, a little bit odd, unusual, different. She, her family said Allison's lost her mind. Her dad got saved, joined the Pentecostal Holiness Church and died in the Pentecostal Holiness Church. Her brother got saved and went into the ministry and spent 30 years in the ministry and as the vice president of a university where I was the president. Her oddness infiltrated the culture in which she lived. And, and if you think I'm just throwing a bouquet to Allison, what I'm talking about is all of us, if we can embrace the pain of the loneliness, step over into the power of the fearlessness and live in the truth, we, our lives will be an indictment on phoniness, fake power, and the uniformity of sin. It's a lonely thing. Don't think for one moment I'm making light of it. It's lonely. And, and, and that loneliness sometimes will be painful. And the closer you snuggle up to Jesus, the odder you look to people that are in the balcony. Is this making sense? I'm not asking if you like it. <laughs> there is, the closer somebody is to God, when Moses got so close to God that his face glowed in the dark, people said, ooh, that's a little weird. When Jesus was so close to God that he was willing to die on the cross, 
His closest friends abandoned him. There is a loneliness about the walk with God. There is an oddness about the life that doesn't look like everybody else. But Jesus understands it. He's been there. He walks with you. He will comfort you in the loneliness of loving him and serving him in truth and in fearlessness and in righteousness. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I hope that you will take this simple little teaching and somehow or another massage it into the deep tissue of our souls. Lord, there are times when we just feel lonely and forgotten and odd, weird. Lord, we don't, we don't want to idolize our own oddness. God forbid. We don't want to manufacture some strangeness. We just want to live in truth and in holiness and in fearlessness. But in doing so, we know the power systems and the phoniness of this world may not cherish us. But we believe you do. Take this, O oh Lord. And make this little teaching somehow helpful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. I hope somehow you can receive this little lesson tonight. God bless you.